Welcome to Make Your Move, the podcast designed to help you get on the property ladder and then figure out what the hell you're doing once you're on there. From deposits to mortgages, surveys to moving day, we can help. Make Your Move is brought to you by Really Moving, the price comparison site for moving home services. Let's get into our episode. Welcome to the Make Your Move podcast, the podcast designed to help make buying a home easier. This week's very special because we're doing our Property Insights Roundup for the end of the year with property heavyweights Rob Halstone from Bold Legal Group and Rob Houghton from Really Moving. In our tale of two Robs, we'll cover what the moving market has looked like this year, the impact of different government changes, we'll hazard a few guesses at what's coming in the future and distill the data about next year to offer some useful insights in case you're planning to buy or sell in 2024. So yeah, welcome to the podcast. We should start by introducing yourselves. Do you want to, who wants to go first? We'll start with Really Moving, Rob. Hello, my name's Rob Houghton. I'm the founder and CEO of reallymoving.com. We started the business in 1999 and here we are coming up to 25 years later. So I would say I'm not an expert in the property market per se. I'm, you know, my skills are running a technology business that's a marketing platform for legal services and other services related to house moving so so that's what really moving does but in doing that we generate a lot of data about the house moving process about the moving market and obviously through working with smart people like Bob Helson for many years you know we, we pick up a few useful things about the the property market the mortgage market the conventional market that are the, the industries that our partner firms work in but our core business and my core business as a businessman is around running the digital marketplace more than the market itself if that makes sense but hopefully we've got enough stats and insights between us to make this an interesting conversation cool and other rob you want to take it away <laughs> Okay, th- thanks, Rob. Um, well, unfortunately, I'm also another Rob, Rob Hailstone, but you can call me Bertie if you want to. My nieces and granddaughters do. I-, I started my conveyancing career back in the mid 70s, and I was a conveyancer for what, 30 years. I gave up in 2005 and got involved in home information packs when the government introduced them. They were a three year flash in the pan. I built the business, we were producing packs, it was going well, but the government did like the results that the uh, home, information packs were, home information packs were bringing, so they scrapped them. Uh, so I had to make my 12 staff redundant and myself and my wife redundant. I didn't want to go back to conveyancing. So in 2010, I set up the Bold Legal Group, which is something I now run. And it's an association of about 700 law firms, all of whom carry out conveyancing. And I update them on anything going on in the property market on a weekly basis. There's a great online forum. And I think my weekly bulletins go to about 5,000 individual conveyances. So my main object in, in my life is to have on my tombstone, he wasn't a bad dad. He was an okay husband, but he did help improve the home buying and selling process, which I'm still working on. All three of them, actually. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you for that. So we today are essentially trying to have a roundup on the year and what's going on in the property market based on both of your experiences working in the property market. So from either of you, you can jump in. What's the market look like this year overall, whether that be with mortgage rates, the cost of living? And it's easy to sort of think it's been a bit of a bad time um, for those who want to buy. But what have you seen this year? Is that completely accurate or is it a bit more nuanced than that? Just what's your outlook? Well, Rob, you put out a really good report on this recently. So let's have some of your stats, please. So I think there's a few things I would say, you know, the The two key factors, as we're all very well aware, is since the Russian invasion of Ukraine, energy prices went through the roof. And although they've come back a little bit, people are still paying probably double what they were paying pre the invasion on energy. So a couple of thousand quid a year, which is clearly very, very painful for for most people um, having to find extra money out of of their household income. And that's, that's limited people's disposable money to spend on anything else, such as a new home or a bigger mortgage. The second thing is, and kind of related, is because of the increase in energy costs, inflation went up significantly. And because inflation has gone up, the Bank of England has, has put up interest rates and mortgage rates have obviously followed interest rates, which means the, the, the cost of taking out a mortgage has gone up. So the cost of borrowing money has gone up. The amount of money that people have available to repay that money has gone down, which has put an inevitable squeeze on the property market. So we've seen the volume of transactions drop quite significantly. You know, it's it's hard to get good real-time data on it. But if you look, at, for example, at the, the volume of mortgage approvals at the moment, it's running about 35% less than it was pre, pre-COVID. pre So, you know, there's been a pretty significant impact on the market transaction levels. Because of that, I think we've seen property prices fall a bit. They probably dropped this year 
by around 5% in nominal terms. But of course, with inflation running at around 7%, that means they probably dropped about 12% in affordability terms. Those numbers are fairly broad because depending on what metrics you use, they're different, but it's probably that sort of overall level. So, so although that increase in affordability of around 12% is helpful, the fact that mortgage rates are so much higher and interest rates is, uh, and interest rates are higher and, and disposable income is so much lower means that it's a pretty difficult market and, and many people now are struggling to trade up in the way they'd like to. So I think that will improve over time. We're already seeing interest rates stabilise. There's a slight chance there'll be need to be another base rate increase, but I think it's more likely that they won't increase now and they'll start to come down. But because mortgage rates are typically two to five year fixed and therefore are based on expectations of future interest rates, because everyone expects them to fall, their mortgage rates have already started falling. So mortgage rates peaked probably three months ago. And since then, we've seen a steady decline. I'd expect that to continue for the next for the next few months. So, so I do think the outlook will improve. Inflation will keep falling. Mortgage rates should keep falling. Property prices, it's a little bit harder to say, because I think it depends on, on the supply demand balance. And I think it depends on how quickly energy prices drop and how quickly mortgage rates come down. Personally, I think my view is that they might not fall that much more in nominal terms, but in real turns, because there's still some inflation in the system, they will become more affordable for a few months yet. So, you know, it's it's been a pretty subdued year. You know, it's not going to pick up for a few months, but I would expect as we get into 2024, it will start to improve a bit. That's a little bit about next year as well as this year, but hopefully that kind of answers the question. Yeah, I, I thanks Rob. I can't fault any of that really. It's all pretty accurate stuff, I think. But I think when you bear in mind how busy the market was during the pandemic for the two years, it's it absolutely flying, how much property prices went up, the drop we've had now, I think is relatively modest in transaction numbers and prices. I think lots of people were expecting a real catastrophe and a real softening of the market, whereas it seems to be reasonably stable now. I think the predictions are about, as you said, most of 1 million transactions a year, which isn't the end of the world. My conveyancing members aren't reporting a huge drop off in, in transactions at the moment. They're still busy with the work they had three or four months ago, obviously. We're in winter now, just about heading into winter. Transactions are usually low at this time of year. So it's not catastrophic at all. And I think next year you have to look pretty reasonable, to be honest. I broadly agree with you, Rob. I think, you know, the, the outlook for next year is more positive. I think we are seeing transaction volumes less effective than current market volumes. So because there's a pretty long time, I think typical sort of offer to completion timescales is four or five months now. So although the land registry recording transaction numbers are still probably only 10 or 15% down on the sort of normal steady state rate, I think that that will slow down further in the coming months because the number of new instructions now is probably, I suspect, nearer a third down on the steady state rate. But I think that as the conditions improve next year, that will pick up again and we'll start to see transaction volumes back to more normal levels as we get into next year. The, the other thing, I guess the thing I would say is having been through this cycle a couple of times is that the fundamental drivers of why people move haven't changed. You know, there's positive new things like new job, new relationship, growing family, all that stuff, as well as the negative stuff like death and divorce and stuff. So those things don't go away. And if you have a period of subdued activity, that builds up a group of people who, who still want to move, but, but can't for affordability reasons. And so when things do improve, those moves do tend to sort of come back into the market. So, so I think while it's subdued, when it comes back, it'll probably come up reasonably strong, you know, and whether that's spring or summer next year or later, who knows? But I think it, I think it, it will come back nicely. And in the long run, we've had so many years of sort of steady state and transactions of around sort of 1.2 million a year. I think that's probably likely to get back to that level before too long. Yeah, and just t touching on transaction times, I think you did just now, Rob, White Movers said recently it's taking 21 and a half weeks on average to move house from accepted offer to completion which is, you know, getting on for six months, which is ridiculous. I think the other thing we've got to bear in mind, of course, is that help to buy is now finished, hasn't it? So the, the first-time buyers don't have that at the moment. An article I was reading the other day said that the government's considering uh, extending the mortgage guarantee scheme, which enables lenders to offer 95% mortgages, as well as other proposals to encourage saving for deposit. And I've also heard a rumour they might be looking at reducing or changing yet again stamp duty sdlt which might help the market but will not please conveyancers because that's been tinkered with so much over, over the last three or four years they've just been pulling their hair out but it is on the cards i think yeah i agree i've, I've heard the same thing i think there's a couple of things on both of those so in terms of the sort of various incentives that the government put out in the past with the help to buy schemes of various flavors i think 
the evidence we've found from looking at the impact of people who use it and don't use it is that help to buy actually increases the average price paid. So arguably, it's introduced with the goal of helping people afford to buy property. But if it ends up putting the prices up, the only people who really benefit from it are the property developers. So, you know, a more accurate description is probably help to sell than help to buy. And so I think we need to be very cautious with introducing new incentive and demand generation schemes because they can end up doing more harm than good for the very people they're trying to help. And it's the same on the stamp duty. You know, if you look at the, to try and kickstart, let's, let's, let's rewind a sec. If you look at the transaction volumes pre-COVID, fairly steady state, around 1.2 million a year. COVID hit, market went into shutdown, transactions fell to almost nothing for a few weeks. No surprise. And then as soon as they opened up the market, the moving home market was one of the first things they reopened. And very quickly, they came back to normal levels. Happy days. And then just when the market seemed to be stable and back to normal, they introduced a stamp duty holiday. Now, OK, you can see why they were trying to kickstart the economy where they could, given the damage that was done and the cost of the economy of COVID. But the real effect of doing that was that it, because of the massive demand, prices went up. And actually, you know, the two years after the sort of summer 2020, when they launched the stamp duty holiday, it was about a 20% house price increase. And so although people saved money on stamp duty, up to about 15% of the, of, the, of the costs, they probably ended up paying more than that because property prices went up. So although it was supposed to help people, it probably actually ended up being a net negative because property prices went up so much more, even if the stamp duty taking was reduced. And if you look at the graphs of stamp duty takings over the last several years, it's actually increased. You know, we used to take around a billion pounds a month in stamp duty tax paid to the government. That went up to about 1.5 billion a month by the peak of 2022. You know, driven that more tax that the house movers had to pay, driven by a policy that was supposed to make it more affordable to move out. So I'd urge great great caution when trying to consider stimulations to try and help encourage the market because it's so difficult to, to model what the impact might be and I think very often they've tried to do things that actually ended up backfiring or helping the wrong people. Yeah absolutely I, I think though in fairness to the government we weren't expecting the market we had once lockdown started but of course everybody wanted not everybody lots of people wanted to move from high rise flats in, in city areas to country and, and coastal areas so it, it did boost the market automatically and they probably got the, the wheels in motion to introduce the stamp duty changes before that happened. So they are actually pouring the fuel on the already existing inferno. And as you say, with results where property prices are up far too high. And I think it's all, also the same with help to buy a bit, because again, I was looking to this the other day, and it says here the original help to buy scheme ran from April 2013 to May 2021, offering an equity loan of up to 20% on the purchase price of a newly old home of up to £600,000, climbing to 40% on a loan for those buying in London. Now, the five-year interest-free equity loan meant that the government had an entitlement to a share of the future sale proceeds equal to the contribution required to assist the purchase. So all those properties have gone up in price, and the government's made a tidy little sum on those when they're being sold. And the other problem you've got, I think, with Help to Buy is that some of those to buy schemes that were taken out four or five years ago, they now have to pay interest on the help to buy bit with the buyers, and that's putting up their monthly and annual payments, as is the increase in their mortgage rate. So they're getting hit twice, and that's only going to continue. So like you said, I think the government needs to look forward sometimes where they introduce these ideas. You know, the law of unintended consequences come in, and, and what could go wrong probably will go wrong, or well-intentioned, but backfires sometimes so interesting interesting stuff there so obviously bringing it back to this year we often talk about property in terms of movers in terms of groups like first-time buyers downsizers upsizers are there any groups of buyers this year or buyers or sellers this year that have really benefited that have been kind of the winners of this year despite some people really struggling i I, that's an interesting question actually i think buy to let people landlords that's an interesting market to to look at because I think they've done extremely well over the last two or three years, the shrewd ones. Some sold at the peak of the market a a year or 18 months ago. Some have said they won't come back in, but now the property prices are dropping and interest rates are dropping and there's an excess of people who want to rent properties. They're saying, we might come in again now. So they make money then and make money again. So I think they've done quite well. Well, out of the state of the economy with the pandemic over the last you know, three or four years. Yeah, agreed. I think the other group that probably have benefited slightly, and I'd say when I say benefit, it's more had been less adversely hit. It's probably cash buyers, and to possibly to extent downsizes. So if you are if you are buying a house for less money than when you're selling, then if, if, if you've timed it right at the top of the market, that's and there's a bit of that, that's that's an advantage for them. And I think given the difficulty with affording a mortgage. 
if you're able to buy a property without a mortgage, you're in a relatively stronger position. So I think cash buyers are in a slightly better place than people buying with a big mortgage. And certainly on the really moving exchange, we have seen an increase in the proportion of people that are buying without a mortgage over the last few months. Yeah, and I suppose it will also depend on how the bank of mum and dad is at the moment with the first time buyers helping them out deposits. My daughter had a lucky escape, I think. She was going to buy about 18 months, two years ago, a flat down in Devon. Luckily for her, there was something wrong with the lease and she pulled out. And since then, that property price has dropped considerably. We've also had the introduction of the Building Safety Act, making some flats more difficult to sell. She had a very lucky escape, and now she's waiting in the wings to pick up a property, hopefully at a cheaper price next year. Thank you. In terms of how technology has developed over the past year, things like generative AI, which is making a difference to my career, for instance, are there any plans for conveyancing and the industry of conveyancing to become a bit more digitalised? at all? Or are there any areas of the home moving process that could be made easier with technological advancements? Well, yeah, I mean, lawyers and technology don't normally go together that well. There are some now looking at technology more and more. And again, there was an article this morning in one of the online legal magazines that says here, conveyancing lawyers from the northeast of England are developing a new legal and property tech-led business. They hope will speed up house sales. And it's based on AI. Home sale pack is being designed to reduce the time it takes from offer to completion, combining the in-depth knowledge of the conveyancer with the use of artificial intelligence to source, analyse and present key documentation to provide upfront information for house sales for the properties marketed. So there are some conveyancers out there looking at AI. I posted that article on LinkedIn, got a lot of negative responses from lots of conveyancers. We're all going to be out of a job in five or ten years. I personally don't think that is the case but at least some are trying it. And to be honest, you know, we can't ignore it. It's, well, it's not coming, it's here. And it's going to get more and more interesting as the days, weeks and years go by. Yeah, I totally agree. I would say of the legal profession, conveyancing is probably the most technically advanced of all of them, which says probably more about the other parts of the conveyancing sector. But there is so much potential for AI to scan contracts and help identify worrying clauses or obligations in there. And I agree with Rob, it's not going to completely take away the need for conventions, but I think it will make them more efficient. It will help people quickly pick up risky areas in legal documents. And there's other things like digitization of search information, digitization of contaminated land, digitization of all the sort of data that you need access to when managing a property transaction. And I think as soon as that's uniformly available in open systems that people can get into, that will inevitably help accelerate and, and reduce the timing and the complexity of, of convincing transactions. So I think it's a it's going to be a net positive for consumers. Not necessarily every lawyer will benefit from that. Clearly, if you're someone that struggles with technology, it'll be more challenging than, than firms that are and individual lawyers that are happy to adopt and embrace it. But but I think it's inevitable that it will have a pretty significant impact on the profession over, over the coming years. I mentioned home information packs in my introduction, which came and went over a three-year period, I think 2007 to 2010, which is basically information up front. And the home buying and selling group at the moment is pushing for conveyances to get involved in transactions much earlier on, i.e. when a a seller puts their property on the market to put a a property transaction pack together, call it what you will. Again, there's a lot of resistance uh, to that idea from a lot of conveyances. What is happening at the moment, and hopefully will come to some kind of fruition next month, is the material information changes that trading standards have been introducing over the last year or two. So they're introducing three phases, A, B and C. A is already in place. B and C should come into force next month. And I I just read you what it said on their website about why they're doing this. For most people, the journey of buying or renting a new home begins with an online search property portal. But for too many, finding out material information about the property after entering into a property transaction can be devastating, causing significant emotional and financial distress. That's why National Trading Standards is working with portals and industry more widely to ensure more material information is made available on property listings so that consumers can make informed decisions and agents can meet their legal requirements at the very beginning of the consumer journey. This will provide greater clarity and consistency across industry, saving agents time and money on wasted inquiries and legal disputes while protecting consumers from nasty surprises. So this is a form of information up front, but I think it's quite distinct from the information up front that the home buying and selling is pushing. So you've got material information, which I think is really intended for the consumer to make an informed offer. You've got upfront information, which is, uh, contains more legal work, I think, which is intended to speed up the conveyancing process. 
Now, it could be the material information when it comes in next month. It could be the catalyst for full up from the foundation in a year or two's time. Uh, we just have to wait and see. And some of the things just quickly that are included in, in, in phase A, which is already there, pretty basic stuff, tenure, i.e. I, freehold or leasehold, council tax, price and rent. And the other two um, phases, I'm not entirely sure yet because they haven't been released, but this is what we to believe might be in them. So phase B could include broadband coverage, phone signal coverage and parking facilities. And then you get to the meat on the bone for a conveyancer in phase C, which could include covenants, easements and restrictions. Uh, we should put covenants, easements and restrictions uh, up front. A lot of sellers will say, what does that mean? But more importantly, a buyer will say, well, really, what does that mean? Can I not trade from home or work from home? Can I not park my white van on property, et cetera, et cetera? So I think then, I'm hoping then, that conveyances will become uh, instructed earlier on in the process, certainly the seller's conveyancer, because the estate agent will not want to put this legal information together in the material information pack that they're going to have to provide. Yeah, I think those are really interesting developments. And, and, I, and I can understand the caution of, of many conveyances, because if you start to provide upfront information on things like covenants and easements and rights away and stuff, you know, the question is, will buyers be able to interpret that information reliably and accurately and, and make a sensible decision on whether that's the right property or not, based on the real impact of that on on their buying decision. And I think that if, if people misinterpret it, it could affect their transaction one way or the other, which doesn't necessarily align with the reality. So I think it's, that's why there's so much caution with some of this information being available. But I think with the right education, with finding the right way to articulate it in a non-legal term so that people can understand what it means and can understand whether it is likely to be significant for them, there must be a way to, to improve the overall transaction process by, by informing people more accurately early on in the process. Yeah, and as I say, there's a lot of pushback on it, particularly on LinkedIn. Some lawyers don't want, want it. They see it as a negative, dumbing down, conveyancing. I don't see it that way. Really, all you're doing is the same work that you would be doing later on earlier. So once an offer is accepted, conveyancer gets instructed, you put together your contract pack with your, your inquiries and your searches, et cetera, et cetera, your title deeds. You're just doing that. We're now talking about full upfront information, really. You're just doing that on day one. So I, as a conveyancer, I'd much rather get all those documents together whilst the property is on the market, have it ready, on the shelf, ready to go out when an offer is accepted. When that goes out, I've got no one chasing me for those documents. Normally, the world and their wife are chasing me. Why haven't you got the searches back? Why haven't you got this back? It's all there in the pack, or 90% of it. It would make life a lot easier for everybody, and I think it would speed up the process. Look, it's not a silver bullet, as some people have been implying. There are no silver bullets to, to speeding up the process. But I think it's a very good start, to be honest. So obviously that's taking conveyancing into account where they are. I'm just curious, is there, do you think there are ways in which other uh, people within the process could be helped by AI technology, like removals, people, surveyors, estate agents, all that? Any ideas on, on that kind of thing, if they maybe already are using that kind of technology? I mean, let's go back through that list. So I think for removal firms, it's kind of difficult to think of a way in which you can significantly transform the process of, of packing up stuff into a lorry and moving it to another place. And that, you know, that really is going to remain a manual activity, I think, as far as, as I can see. I think the only area where there may be opportunities to improve that is in the surveying process and in the home surveying process where you're estimating the volume of possessions. If you've got some sort of smart camera, you can maybe walk around the house with your with your phone and that can scan the stuff it sees and provide an accurate volume estimation that might improve the speed and accuracy of furniture volume estimations. Some of those things are available now. I don't think well, well, Amazon are delivering parcels by drones now. Anything could happen in the next five or ten years. <laughs> you, you could have your piano and sofa dropped in your back garden. Uh, that's a very good point. I hadn't thought of that. Okay, take it all back. It's going to be transformed tomorrow. There'll be Rob Hailston Drone Removals PLC will be launched within a matter of weeks. I think I think what removers would like to see is when completion takes place on a Friday, it takes place at the same time throughout the chain. So person at the bottom might complete at 10 or 11 in the morning, but if you've got a long chain, the person at the top might not complete till 4, 5, 6 o'clock, or the banks might have closed, they might not complete till Monday and they're homeless. And this is what really stresses out removers. So if we get a system, they are working on these systems at the moment, whereby everybody can complete at, say, one o'clock, it will be a lot easier, less stressful time for removers. 
and particularly the home buying and selling public. I think it's called real-time growth settlement is what they're looking into. Very catchy. And I think thinking in surveyors, there's probably some opportunities for AI. So if you can have a, a, an AI tool there where a surveyor can take a photograph of a particular thing that he or she might be worried about and get real-time information and analysis of what the issue is and whether the, whether that crack or that level of damp or whatever really is a problem. There's probably ways in which this, the surveying process can be helped. I mean, I think a lot of experienced say they don't they don't need AI to do that. They can tell just by their years of experience. But but I suspect it'll it'll probably be some sort of help. And maybe in the production of a, of a surveying report could be streamlined and accelerated if you can there's there's already some tools that do part of this process but if you can if you can make it easier to create a survey so the survey can go around and then publish it very quickly in a, in a digestible and intelligible format to the buyer that will probably help streamline the, the, the home surveying process yeah and, the, and this isn't technically ai but uh, a lot of conveyances now will look at a property that they're at when they're acting for a buyer on, on Google Maps, look at the aerial view, get an idea of the surroundings, have a look at the boundaries. Conveyances don't go and visit properties very often. Like if once back in the day, I remember measuring the, the, the distance from the front gate to the back gate for some reason, but this was in about 1978. Conveyances don't do that. We didn't do it very often then, but by getting an aerial view, you can see if the boundaries match up with the boundaries on the file plan from the land registry. You can see if there's any weird access ways at the back and add buildings that shouldn't be there. So all that is helping already. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And I think, you know, if you look at how, I mean, I last bought a house 25 years ago. In fact, the house, the, the prices were such a disaster. I thought there must be a better way to do this. I know I'm going to start an online business today. And here we are 25 years later. So, but the only part of the process that has really changed significantly since then is really the, the online property listings or the, or the, the, the way you can view property details. Back when I first started buying property, 40 years ago almost, I, I bought my first flat. You were really going to look in estate agent windows, you were looking at the local paper to see listings of, of, of properties that might match. And now the fact that through Rightmove and Zoopla on the market, you could, you've could you got pretty much every property on the market that is available 24-7 and, and so much extra information. That is, that is a radical transformation of the way that you look at and, and find property. And it probably helps you consider a much wider area because although in the old days, it was incredibly resource intensive to look for property in a certain area. Whereas if you can now be less prescriptive the way you want to look and say, well, I want to be able to get to this location for work and I've got this much budget, then there are tools that help you find other areas you perhaps haven't even considered that you can look at. So I think the estate agents stroke property listing side of it is the bit that's been transformed more than any others recently and I'm sure that further developments in AI and technology will continue to improve that and enhance that over the years to come. I, I also feel that the, the job of the conveyance has become far more challenging over the last 20 or so years. When I was doing conveyancing, as I said, back in the 20th century, we didn't have much unregistered land, we didn't have originally email and internet and yet transaction times were quicker the process was less stressful than it is now, which is bizarre because we moved on 30, 40, 50 years now, and it's slower. And I think part of the problem is they've got many more tasks now than we had back in the day. I might have had seven to 10 plates to keep spinning at any one time. I think now they've got 25 to 30 plates because you've got the things like anti-money laundering, source of funds check, ID checks. You've got Japanese knotweed to worry about. You've got climate change to worry about. You've now got the Building Safety Act to worry about. And more and more is piled on the conveyancer, which makes their job more challenging. And actually makes us the process much slower. And there's got to be a breaking point. And I think we're reaching it, to be honest. Thank you. That was extremely insightful. A lot of information there. Um, in terms of potentially what's going on next year because of this year, obviously the budget last year with Lowe's Trust and Quasi Crossing was um, impactful. Can you give us a sense of how that affected 2023? I know that might be a lot. And then potentially, if you're able, give us a sort of prediction of what the next housing budget might look like based on your expertise and how that might impact 2024. That's a very long, convoluted question. So if you want me to say it in a, in a simpler way, do let me know. But yeah, go ahead. If you look at the graph of transactions and demand on really moving, there's an absolute cliff edge the day of the famous mini budget. It, was, it had a catastrophic impact on demand for property. And we all know about the economic impact. And that turmoil has continued going on into, into 2023. How much of that was as a direct result of the mini budget? 
and how much of it was kind of happening anyway is harder to unpick. Because if you look at where mortgage rates are now, they're not that different to where they were immediately after the mini budget. So, and that's obviously driven more by fuel crisis and inflation and cost of living stuff than it was particularly by the budget. So I think although it was in the short term incredibly painful, I'm not convinced it had a significant long-term impact. You know, it's small relative to things like COVID, stamp duty holiday and the Russian invasion of Ukraine. So I think I think we're kind of past that now. In terms of outlook for next year, and we talked a little bit before about the fact that, that certainly I think most people expect to see inflation carry on falling and therefore interest rates will fall. So I think it will become more affordable. I think there's a general expectation that, that energy will continue to fall. How long it will take to get back to pre-Russian invasion of Ukraine levels I'm not sure. Maybe it won't because we've obviously had to rebalance our sources of energy quite significantly. So I think that's 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 possibly going to have a sort of a permanent impact. But I do think that will drive a pickup in the market as we get into 2024. I think the big unknown for next year, really, we're going to have a general election either late 2024 or very early 2025. And the big unknown is the extent to which the government decides to implement mechanisms to try and stimulate the, the housing market for, you know, for political or, or I guess you can argue for economic purposes, but clearly for, for political benefit as well. And, you know, we've talked a bit in the previous questions about the impact of, of help to buy in its various forms and the stamp duty holiday. So, but I think there's a pretty decent chance, you know, the government has a strong track record of interventionist policies in the housing market. And I think it would be a brave person that would get a bet against further interventions in the next few months. And what that might be, and how much it impacts the market is very hard to predict really reliably. But I think there's a there's a decent chance they'll do stuff that will try and stimulate demand, but might also prop up prices. Yeah, and of course, we, unfortunately, we've got to factor in the situation in the Middle East. It's probably going to get worse in the, in the short term, at least. And that's going to have an economic effect on the world generally, isn't it? So that could come into play as well. Uh, so it's very dif- difficult to predict, I think, next year, with as you say, with the election and the Ukraine situation and uh, the Gaza situation. Yeah, that's a really good point. It's a sort of a Israel-Palestine thing. It's one thing, but if it does end up ex- expanding to the rest of the Middle East, then it could be really, really impactful in terms of energy prices and energy supply. That's that's a quite a scary prospect. But we're not here to be all doom and gloom, are we, Rob? So let, let's look at the upside, and that is that interest rates have stabilised, etc. But I think, I think I, overall, I would say, I think, 2024 will be better than 2023. I think I think there's there's cause for optimism that it's that it's going to head in the right direction, subject to not being a catastrophic escalation of the Middle East. I think that that's what I would hope to see. Yeah, one other thing I meant to I meant to mention earlier is in the King's speech next week. I think it's um, in, in November. It might not be next week when this pod goes, podcast goes out, but in the King's speech, the government's looking to phase out leaseholds, but that is only for new houses. Obviously, we've spoken a lot about how next year's looking in terms of things improving or not improving as it might. But do we have any other thoughts on any ways that 2024 might look different? And specifically, are there any groups of people, like we spoke about earlier, people who've benefited from the market this year, any groups of people that are looking to benefit from how things will change into the new year? The first-time buyers, the cash buyers, the downsizers maybe, the landlords might benefit, you know, the buy-to-lets, pretty much almost anybody I think I've covered there. But yeah, it doesn't look like an awful time to think about you know, buying a property, your first property next year, as long as you monitor the situation generally with, with world crises. Yeah. And anyway, is ever a good time? You know, it's, it's like having a baby. It's, you've got to buy it. So buy it. It'll go up eventually. It always does. Yeah, I broadly agree with that. I think, you know, we've talked about the the fundamentals and what might happen to prices and to interest rates and, and cost of living and stuff. So I think that the unknown factor is whether there's government intervention that favours one particular group more than another. You know, I, I get asked a lot by friends and family, you know, when should I buy? And my, my response is always, you know, don't try and double guess the market because you just can't. I just think, you know, you buy when it's right for you and just make sure you're taking a long term view. If you're buying with an expectation you're going to make money and two, three, four years, that's very, very risky. But if you're buying as a long term, not necessarily that particular property, but the expectation of being in the property market for many, many years, then you'll, you'll probably be doing okay. So let, let's take a, a hypothetical 25 year view then, Rob. Say you bought a property 25 years ago, what would that p- property price have been? What do you think that property price might be now? Not that you did that, of course. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's difficult, isn't it? Because clearly there have been some benefits for people 
like you and me, Rob, that I suspect bought our first property many, many decades ago. Typically speaking, in the long, long run, once you've adjusted for interest rates uh, and everything, is, is that property prices broadly go up in line with salaries, not inflation. And given that salaries generally go up by about 2% more than inflation in the long run, you tend to see property prices going up related to earnings more than inflation. So I think in the last few years, we've seen that gap stretched in that house prices have become a higher multiple of salaries in the past, driven in large part by incredibly low interest rates. And I think those very low interest rates are something that I think we can't have any expectation of getting back to. You know, I think they'll come down from where they are now quite significantly, but I don't think they're likely to go down to the sort of pre-COVID levels of 1% or 2% for a long time, if ever. But I think coming down to sort of 4% or whatever, 3 4 5% is a, is a realistic medium-term prospect. So I, I think I think to answer your question, Rob, the prospect of some of the big capital gains that people have made over the past 25 years is probably unlikely. But I think some modest real improvement, real increase in, in, in asset value is, is probably realistic. And the benefit you have with buying property is because you can borrow money to buy it, then if you borrow 80% of the value and it does go up by, by a reasonable amount, then actually your equity can go up in a in a, in a leveraged way. So so I think that will carry on. And I think I don't see any fundamental reason why that would change in the next 25 years, even if the, the level of gains aren't what they have been in the past. And, and we are a nation of homeowners. We like buying our homes. We like owning our homes. And you know, when you get to retirement age, it's nice to know you've got a home with a mortgage paid off and you don't have to pay rent for the rest of your lives. I think the worst property crash I can remember is probably the 2008 one, which went on for a number of years. And there were an awful lot of properties then that were in negative equity for a very, very long time. But we're, we're nowhere near that at this, this moment in time. And hopefully, hopefully we won't see that again, yeah. That's really most of it. That We have one more question, which is just essentially a roundup on your thoughts. But thank you for coming to this. It's been really insightful. So, Rob and Rob, how would you both sum up the year for the industry um, in just a few words or a few paragraphs? It's totally up to you. Go on, give you a prediction for 2024 then, Rob. Yeah, thanks. I mean, I, I don't think I've got anything to say that I haven't really already said about, you know. So I think describing 2023 in a word or two, subdued, you know, held down by high interest rates and low disposable income because of energy prices. I expect that to ease in 2024 and therefore the property market to become more active, a little bit more buoyant, if not quite back to pre-COVID transactions levels in 2024. But I certainly think it'll be it'll be more active than it was in 2023. So I'm optimistic for a for a slightly more positive next 12 months than this. Yeah, I think next year will be a roller coaster, but I think it will be like a little kiddies roller coaster for the seven or eight year olds, not the ones that the high adrenaline junkets want to go on. Uh, so I think it's relatively calm. All I would say is for people looking to sell their property, you know, think about instructing your conveyancer on day one and getting a property transaction pack ready. And if you're thinking of buying, go and get your mortgage agreed in principles so that when, when you make an offer, you can proceed quickly. Thank you very much. Well, that's all of our questions. We've had a lot to say. We've got a lot to <laughs> lot to talk about here. Brilliant. Yeah, thank you for coming. So that was a lot of information to take in, but um, what's your main takeaway from all that? Um, I would say that my main takeaway from all of that information, and there was a lot to take in because it was a year and next year and potentially the next 20 years at one point, but I would say that there's never a good time to buy a house. Things are always going to get more expensive. The best time to buy a house is when you're ready to. What about you, Jez? Um, I was very interested to hear that sometimes incentives that are meant to help, like stamp duty holiday and interest, actually end up making things more expensive. So don't just blindly think, oh, now's a good time to buy because there's an incentive. And we can see that like the market's down this year because of all the craziness that happened due to some of that stuff from the last few years. And, you know, as you say, there's never a good time. There's always something going on. So just to be more wise about when really is a good time to buy and maybe this incentive actually is making things harder for you. Thank you for listening to the Make Your Move podcast and we hope to see you next time. You've been listening to Make Your Move podcast here to make moving simple we hope you found this episode useful but as always 
Everyone's situations are different, so make sure to do your own research before making your move. Make Your Move is brought to you by Really Moving, the price comparison site for moving home services. If you have any experiences or questions you'd like to share or ask that might be put on a later episode, please email us at podcast at See you on the next episode.